Uh, dear colleagues, welcome back to the second day of Handball for All Digital Edition. I would like to say hello for those who just joined us today and wish nothing than best, and to invite all of you to take an active participation in today's presentation. If you have any question for our lecture, or if you just want to share opinion with other participants, please send a message in a private chat to Akim or to me. Few words about our guest, who is act actually the host here. Mr. Feldman is someone who has been with us from the very beginning, a veteran of our academy in the best sense of the term. Participating in the academy four times, he became synonymous with her, with her and friend and colleague, one of those who helped us to build this project on a real professional international way. It's a special pleasure to see you among us again, Klaus. Welcome back and take us on another unforgettable journey with you. Thank you very much. Okay, here we are. And this is the presentation day. So welcome everybody to this uh, webinar in that very special time. I hope that uh, everybody is uh, well and in a, in a good way uh, to come back to handball and to return to the court. Um, and if in this situation on the court, uh, you will remember the 10 instructions in handball of today, uh, then maybe our presentation was a little bit helpful. Those 10 instructions in handball are let's say 10 sentences or 10 aspects, uh, which in the last years have uh, become more and more clear to me uh, as some, let's say, basic elements of my philosophy in handball. And uh, I want to just explain, give some video examples uh, uh, in, in some slides, uh, what is behind this idea of the 10 instructions. Sometimes it's very simple, sometimes uh, it's a little bit more complex, uh, just like our game is. So the first instruction uh, we have in handball is about how handball is played. And handball, from my point of view, is played uh, as a game with the legs and the head. Uh, so to some of you, this might be a surprise because you think that you use the arms and the hands. Uh, but first of all, I think we have to play with the legs and with the head. So playing with the legs is something very important because with the legs, you move the body. Uh, so you run from the defense to the attack and back. Uh, in defense, you move forward, backward and sideward. In attack, you move to the different spaces to find the gap. Uh, and the more the players are running, the better it is for the game. If only the player with the ball is moving, uh, then it's a very boring and a very slow game. Uh, and the quality of the game, from my point of view, uh, is getting higher and higher, the more especially the players without ball move. Uh, actually, the development in our game is not in that direction, I have to be honest, uh, because if we look at modern attacks, uh, uh, you will see always the two wing players standing in the corner and waiting for a free shot. Uh, and what a surprise to the past, uh, the player who is running the most is the pivot, who is always coming out of the defense and running from one side to the other, making a crossing with the center-back player. Uh, even in the seven against six, uh, with less space for attackers, uh, uh, the game is very static. Uh, so that's why I don't like the actual situation or the actual tendency. Uh, I like to have a game which is played uh, with much more movement and much more uh, uh, um, individual actions of all players. The second aspect is that handball is a game that is played with the head. Uh, so in your head, you have your eyes to get information from the court. And in your head, you have your brain uh, to make a decision. And we can say that handball is a complex game of decision making. Uh, you will hear some aspect of that afterwards in uh, another instruction. 
And the better the players are in decision making, the better it is for our game. I have a small uh, picture here, a, a simple picture here that shows something. Uh, it's from a, a junior international game. It was Hungary in attack uh, against Norwegian defense uh, from a, a junior world championship of the girls. And you can see the right back player number 10 uh, you see the defense in ball possession. You see the defense of the Norwegian team, a uh, little bit typical for uh, um, uh, female games uh, because you have the gap between first and second defender very wide open. Uh, and the girl in attack, she seems to be a right-handed player because she has the ball in the right hand. Uh, and the gap between first and second defender is really open. But from her position of the body, from her orientation, uh, you can see what she will do. She will move inside. And this, from my point of view, is not the correct decision. The correct decision in that movement, in that moment, must be straight to the gap between first and second defender. Uh, so maybe something is not correct with her perception, with her observation, or maybe she is making a bad decision in that moment. Uh, but if we want to have more quality in our game, we need players that are making really good decisions. And this depends on the uh, taking of the information and the dealing with the information. And this is something which happens in the head. So that's why, finally, I have the idea that handball is a game which is played with the legs and with the head. The second instruction, is the first relation between defense and attack. We say that defense structures attack. So that means if it is a real big difference if you play an attack against an open defense or against a close defense. If the defense is very defensive around the six meter area, it's easy for the attackers to go over the center line to go to the attack positions, to circulate the ball, to prepare the moves in attack. And then if you go to the goal, okay, then space is a little bit decreased and defense tries to work against you. Huh? But compare this situation to uh, an open defense when the attackers just have crossed the center line and immediately a defender is in front of them huh? and they don't get the ball without running free. And if they get the ball, they receive it in a position far away from the goal. So they cannot immediately shoot. Huh? So they have to run free without ball. They have to move one-on-one -on -one with the ball to come at, uh, close to the goal to make a proper shot. Huh? And this is a completely different structure of attack. And this is the result of a different type of defense. Huh? So that's why we say defense structures attack. And for this uh, I have a quite good example how this is working. Uh, you see this scene here. It's from a Bundesliga game from Germany, Ryan Neckerleven against Flensburg. And you see the defense is doing nothing in that moment. But, and this is something I don't like so much, the attack doesn't do anything for a very long time. So the attack isn't active too. Uh, you see the players circulate the ball, and then finally, acceleration, and after two passes, the right wing is free. But see the scene from the beginning, and you can see how long it takes time. Now the defense specialist is going out, right wing as an attacker is coming in. You see the players bouncing the ball on the spot. Uh, then change position very slow. Uh, and this is, from my point of view, a waste of time. Uh, but they can allow to do it in that way because they are not under pressure from the defense. Defense is doing not enough. Uh, and the result is such an easy goal shot. Compared this to one scene we have here from the European Championship Final 2018. It was Spain, red in defense against Sweden in attack. And you can see here now how open, how active the defense is and the attackers, they don't know what to do. Uh, so this was the first 
interception or attempt for interception and with the second they were successful just see it once again and you can see open defending against center back open defending against right back uh, feint in defense uh, sinking back coming up again uh, so this is a different type of defense and from this you have a different type of attack players must move without ball and must take care how to pass uh, and this is the result of that open defense okay now we're coming to the third instruction and this is just the other way around the second relation between attack and defense and in this way we say attack teaches defense this is something very important especially for our training because if we want to have defense to work very strong and very hard we need good attackers against them you cannot teach defense with cheap uh, or with a poor attackers uh, so the stronger the players in attack are the more the players in defense have to do uh, this is the same on the individual level strong individual moves one-on-one uh, -on -one to both sides and shooting this is the same in cooperation uh, the better the crossing the better the the screening uh, the more work for the defense and this is the same in the collective level, uh, team tactics in attack, the more variability we have in attack, the more the defense is enforced to react on that. Uh, so if we want to have a successful and efficient training for the defense, we always need strong attackers too. Uh, and this is, from my point of view, a quite nice thing for us as coaches, because we never teach defense uh, without teaching attack. Uh, and this saves a little bit of time in our game or in our training. Okay, let's come to the fourth instruction. And this is the first one that deals with the basic principles we have in defense and the fifth one in attack. So the first are the four basic principles in defense. Something very easy, very simple, some of you might think in the first moment but on the other side uh, you will see that even in top level players are making mistakes when they violate against those basic principles so let's see what is basic principle number one the first one is find your opponent when you are in the defense and assign yourself to him this is the same in a defensive defense or in an open defense. Uh, even in man-to-man -man defense, uh, everyone needs to find an opponent, uh, the one who is just on the same level of speed, of strength, uh, tactical skills, and so on. Or you do the same when you are in a zone defense. Uh, you have to find the opponent in your zone on your position. Uh, so wing defender against wing attacker, center defender against pivot, and so on. Uh, so if one player in defense has no personal opponent in that moment, maybe the problem is that in another position are two. And this is not very nice for the defense. Uh, so it's very, very important that as soon as you get back to defense, you find your personal opponent or the, person, or the opponent on your position uh, and assign yourself to him. Second basic principle in defense is take the position between opponent and goal. This is the best position a defender can take because the attacker, he wants to go to the goal. So the defender must be in front of him, uh, never give him the chance to break through straight, uh, enforce him to go to one or around to the other side, uh, but never give free the direct way to the goal. On the other side, this is something the referees like very much, because from that frontal position uh, between opponent and goal, you can get into contact with your personal opponent. Whereas if you make an action coming from the side or from behind, uh, you, will, you are always under the under danger to re receive a personal punishment. Uh, so the basic position between opponent and goal is something very, very important for successful defending and defending according to the rules. Third is 
the observation. Uh, now, defense has to observe, or defenders have to observe two things. First is personal opponent. Second is the ball. But in that situation, uh, we have two variations. Uh, so one is the so-called one and one with ball situation. When your opponent is in possession uh, of the ball, then the defense can focus the observation to opponent and ball because opponent is in ball possession. So the two things are on the same place. But this is getting much more difficult by the time the ball is in another position because then the defense has to spread the observation, see the personal opponent on one side and see the ball on the other side. And the far away the ball is, the more difficult it is to see opponent and ball at the same time. And this is something which is the same in open defense and in closed defense. In closed defense is a little bit easier because if the defense is at the six meter line, everything is happening in front of the defense because in the back of the defense is the goal area and nobody can enter except the goalkeeper of the defending team. Uh, but if you are in an open defense, then it's getting much more difficult because maybe you take your position far away, 16, 17 meters away from the goal, and the ball is maybe 12 or 10 meters to the goal only. And then you have to turn around and try to see opponent and ball in the same moment. So this is why this one-on-one -on -one without ball situation is a little bit more demanding in that aspect uh, because the observation of opponent and ball is much more difficult. The last one is the one which is the first type of cooperation in defense and it's help. Help is something which is really crucial. Help is something which is really, really needed and has to be worked out in every type of defense. So if in a neighboring position, the player with the ball, attacker with the ball, is breaking through successfully, every defender must go away from his personal opponent and try to help against that breaking through attacker. Very many of you may think this is not possible in an open defense, but I will tell you that it is even better possible in an open defense. The difference is that if you play a very close defense, then the one-on-one -on -one situation may be at eight meters away from the goal. And with two steps, the player in attack can come to the six meter line and break through and shoot. If in that moment the help is not coming very fast, uh, there is no more chance for helping in that way. Uh, compared to this, in a, very, in a very open defense, the one-on-one -on -one situation is far away from the goal. So if an attacker breaks through, let's say 15 or 16 meters away from the goal, he cannot shoot because he's still too far away from the goal. He needs to go to, let's say, nine or eight meters to make a successful shot. So he needs to cover base and this takes time. And this is the time for everyone else in defense to go away from his personal opponent and try to stop the breaking through attacker. So help is really possible in every defense type, no matter whether it is an open defense or whether it is a closed defense. Huh? And help is really compulsory. Huh? You have to give help. There is no reason not to help. Huh? On the other side, uh, you can see that the help is depending on the third basic principle here, observation of opponent and ball. Because if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one situation without ball, and the ball is on the neighbor position, but I'm only observing my opponent, uh, I cannot see what is happening on the neighbor position, and then I cannot make the decision. So that's why it is very, very important in that moment to observe opponent and ball and then make a proper decision for help. Two examples uh, we have uh, for that maybe later on in uh, our, um, in our uh, video. Okay, 
Now, fifth instruction is about the four basic principles in attack. Similar or same like in defense, we have four basic principles. In attack, it's a little bit more difficult. It's not so easy. Uh, so this will take us some more minutes to explain, but I will try to hurry up. Okay, the first one is to open the central area. The central area in my idea of handball is the area from which the players can score with a high probability of success. This is not every time the same area because this depends on technical skills and athletical skills. Huh? So if you have players huh, on the left wing position, on the right wing position with a very good technique to shoot from a very small angle and this effective area, the central area, is very open in the width. If you have players very tall, good jumping and good shooting power from outside nine meter, they can shoot successfully maybe from 10, maybe from 11 meters. Then the central area is open in the depth. But if your players in your team are missing those technical skills and those athletical skills, then the space is reduced in the width and in the depth. Uh, so that's why the central area is not always in, or has not always the same size. Uh, it depends on the level of the players in your team or in the attacking team. But nevertheless, whether it is a big central area or a smaller one, uh, basically uh, the, the idea in attack should be to open that space. Uh, because if the defense realizes uh, what is the central area and takes position in that central area, they will decrease the space and offer only the bad spaces to the attackers. So the players in attack must open that central area and they can do it with two things. First is with their positioning. Uh, so if they take a position inside the central area, all, uh, it's uh, very easy to, to, to follow and to see that the defense will be there too. Then the basic area is crowded and there is no space anymore. Uh, so they need to have a positioning out of the central area to draw the defense to the side on one on the other side uh, and to open that central space. Uh. On the other side, this is the reason why today we have the wing players in the corners and we have left and right back players in attack very close to the sideline. Uh, so this is the positioning uh, that opens the area in the center the most. Uh, but the result of this is that the ball is only circulated from right back, center back, center back, left back, and then to the other side, because if the right or the left back is in ball possession, uh, they are, the ball is already at the sideline, and then passing to the wing would not enforce the defense to move more. Okay, second uh, way or second aspect for this uh, first basic principle to open the central area is if the players move inside the central area with the ball, if they penetrate and the defense decreases the space and stops the attacker, then the attacker has to release the ball and immediately follow that idea to open the central area. So that means go back and go to the side away from the ball, open the, the, uh, the space around the ball. <clears throat> and some of you may know some players which don't realize that idea. They run inside the defense, they pass away and they stand. Or even worse, they pass and follow the ball and decrease the space around the ball even more. <clears throat> so from my point of view, it just uh, should be just the other way around. Move inside, pass the ball away and immediately backwards, sideward, away from the ball, to open the central area again. Second aspect or second basic principle in that uh, uh, four principles in attack is first way for the ball possessor. This is something I like very much. Uh, we will come back to this uh, later on once again. Um, 
And uh, I always start when explaining about this with a different uh, sentence. I say, the most dangerous player on the court is the one with ball and high speed moving to the opponent's goal. These are the three criteria that have to be fulfilled. The player has to be in ball possession, he has to move with high speed, and he has to move towards the opponent's goal. This is the most dangerous player. If he's moving without ball, okay, somebody must follow, but as long as he's not in ball possession, he cannot shoot. If he's moving slow, is not maximum danger. If he's moving away from the opponent's goal, okay, let him go. Huh? But if he's moving with ball, high speed, and towards the opponent's goal, this is the most dangerous player on the court. And if we know this, and if we accept this, on the second step, we must make this as a, as a, a, a coaching order, uh, or give this as a coaching order to our players. So please try to motivate and to educate every player that he is willing and able to be the most dangerous player on the court. Means if he is in ball possession, going with high speed to opponent's goal. And if you have six players on the court doing so, you have a wonderful team. Uh, because everyone is dangerous, everyone is going to opponent's goal. And the defense doesn't know uh, which player is more dangerous and which to concentrate or to focus on. Uh, if you have only two players who do that, the defense will find out uh, and will kill those two. Uh, and the other four, oh, they're always passing the ball. They are not active in attack. They will not take care for them so much uh, and they will focus on the dangerous players so the more dangerous players you have in your team the better it is uh. but this means that if the player with the ball should go with high speed to opponent's goal then all the other players without ball must wait and give first way to the ball possessor uh. if you have a positioning outside the central area the players without ball cannot run in and decrease the space for the ball possessor. They have to wait, and the first way is to the ball possessor, and if the defense focuses on him, he can pass to the next, and this one follows, huh? and the same to the other side. Huh? So that's why this first way for the ball possessor is a very important basic principle in attack. Third is the backstop or the safety behind the ball possessor. If the ball possessor is moving, he will not all towards opponent's goal. He will not always break through successfully. Uh, defense might stop him. Uh, then taking up the ball, using the three steps, maybe using the three seconds, he has to release the ball. If in that situation, in that moment, all the players are in front of him against the defense who is blocking the pass, it's very difficult to find something free. That's why players in neighboring position must come out of the defense for a safety pass behind. Huh? And this is the way uh, the players are doing it in attack every time, especially when they go against a defensive defense, huh? because the players receive the ball, they penetrate, and they pass the ball a little bit back, and the next one is coming. Pass back, and the next one is coming. And if you cannot continue that side, maybe he's running behind you, and you release the ball, and he's going around. Maybe you say this is crossing, but first of all, it's a safety pass without chance for the defense to intercept the ball. Okay, and the last one, basic principle is here, to shift the game to the other side. Because if by penetration towards the goal, the defense was drawn on one area of the court, then the space is decreased on that side. But there is open space on the other side. Now the ball must be passed to the other side uh, to use the open space and the free area on the free side. Uh, and this is a, a basic uh, element of attack we have in other games too. For instance, if you watch football on TV, you will always see that 
on the ball side, their defense is compressed and there are more defenders than attackers. And then the attackers should try to pass the ball to the other side uh, where the open space is. In handball, it's the same. Now, a small example for this, and you will see players. Uh, it's an old video. I'm a little bit sorry about that, but it's so easy to see how the basic principles are working in that attack movement. So what you see, first of all, is a standard tactical element, crossing without and crossing with ball. But when you see the scene from the beginning, you will see the positioning of the players. Left back, close to the sideline. Right back, a little bit more inside, but in wide positioning. Left and right wing, we don't see because they're standing in the corners. So this is to open the space. And with the style, uh, with the crossing, without ball, even more the space in the center is open. So center back passes now to left back, moves away to the right back position, whereas right back is now coming inside. Yeah. So, and this is the moment when the player with the ball is going with high speed to the goal and first way for the ball possessor. Looking for the one and one situation and now maybe shooting, but as you can see, Safety for the ball possessor, left back is coming from his position behind. And now we have the situation, left back can shoot, left back may pass to the pivot, but you see the compression on the left side of the attack, whereas there is open space on the right side. So the pass is given to center back player and with a very open space for him, it is very easy to solve the one-on-one -on -one situation. So once again, open the space and finally shifting the game to the other side. Huh? So open the space, first way for the ball possessor, safety behind, shifting the ball to the other side. That's the way. Huh? Okay, coming to instruction number six. Uh, and this is one of three, six, seven, and eight, which are always uh, uh, build it up in, uh, in the same, uh, in, in similar sentences, you might say. So the first one, uh, the sixth one, is about the spaces in game. So, and we say, who is able to play in an open space should be able to play in smaller spaces too. But if you have always played in small spaces only, uh, you will feel problems when you have to play in open space. This is something which, again, is a little bit in combination with our first instruction. Playing with the legs and playing with the head. Because in an open space game, uh, with a very open defense, uh, you have to move forward, backward and sideward in defense and you have to cover the space in attack. Uh, so you have to run much more, uh, more flexibility in movements, turning to the left, turning to the right, forward, backward, sideward movements. Uh, so if you learned to play in open space, it's no problem to play or to continue playing in smaller space. But if you have always played in small spaces only, and then maybe five minutes to the end of the game, because your team is three goals behind, and your, the coach tells, uh, go for man-to-man -man defense, and then you have to use that open space. Huh? You will not be sure in all those movements, in all those running step work elements you need in the open space. Huh? So that's why learning handball in open space uh, is something from my point of view very very important and afterwards playing in small spaces is no problem and it is the same with the head and with the observation as we said before in defense you have to observe opponent and ball uh, you can do that at the six meter line or you can do that in open space 
which is much more demanding. Huh? And in that moment, huh, even orientation and perception uh, is much more demanding in that open space. So should, you should learn, or players should learn to, uh, to uh, or start to learn in open space huh, and making it easier for them, reducing the space afterwards. But if you have only learned to orientate and observe in small spaces, and then you are put it into the situation to use the observation in open space, you will fail, for sure you will fail. Huh? And it's about the pressure uh, from the defense which is given when you play in open spaces. Uh, and this is something which is not, cannot be learned in a reduced defense or in a defensive defense uh, because the, the pressure to the attackers is not as high. So that's why, from my point of view, playing in open spaces is something very, very important from the running skills, from the decision making, uh, and I think even players in top level should, from time to time, use this game in open space uh, and in transition from attack to defense and vice versa. It's even a game in big space, uh, so then the players for sure need the, to, to orientate and to run over the full court. So let's come to number seven, which is about the speed in our game. And to be honest, uh, I don't like the actual development in our game because our game is getting slower and slower in the last years. Uh, um, I have heard uh, a, a special statistic from uh, the World Championships. It was from the last one in 2019, Germany and Denmark. Uh, they had 56 attacks per team per game uh, in this men World Championship. But eight years before, in Sweden, 2011, it was 66 attacks between, uh, uh, per team per game. Uh, so that means 10 attacks for each team more in one game. So altogether 20 attacks more in the Sweden 2011 World Championship compared to the Germany and Denmark 2019 World Championship. Uh, and as you saw from this video example from Annika Leuven to, uh, against Flensburg, uh, you can see why the number of attacks is going back. Uh, because if, if attackers go to the positions, circulate the ball for a very long time, very slow, change the specialist of defense against an attacker and so on. Uh, this is a waste of time and the game is not as fast as it was before. Uh, on the other hand, you can see fast break or transition game more or less only with first wave, sometimes a little bit second wave, uh, but third wave has almost disappeared, uh, quick throw off almost disappeared. Uh, so the players and the coaches, they don't use those elements to play fast. But from my point of view, in certain situation, the players have to be able to play fast, uh, especially when on one side your team is behind with the number of goals, or on the other side to put some pressure to the opponent. Uh, because if you have a physically strong team and they can run very much and very fast, uh, with always going high speed from defense to attack, you will enforce the opponent's team to retreat in that way. Uh, and maybe after 30 minutes, 40 minutes, they are going down with the physical level because they are not ready to, to uh, adjust to that high speed game. Uh, so that's why I say, if you can play with high speed, it's no problem to slow down the speed in the game. But if you always play slow, uh, you will have big problems when you want to turn the switch and to play fast. On the other hand, playing with high speed is on one side, physical element, running skills are very important. But again, like we have heard in our first instruction, 
it's an element of quick decision making yeah? because the transition from especially from defense to attack is from my point of view very much depending on the correct moment of starting uh, and this is something which is made in the head of the players uh. so if we want to have good players we need or a good team we need to work out our training in a high speed way uh. in game we can use it or not uh. but if we always train slow uh, we will all always fail when we want to play fast in the competition okay and number eight in the same way is about something special uh, uh, i have uh, in my observation since very many years now it's about dribbling in our game uh, especially in germany but in other countries too we have so many coaches since so many years who always want to avoid dribbling from the players uh, don't dribble pass 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 it's always the same story uh, and i'm really bored from that uh, 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 argumentation uh, because oh it's a nicer game if they play more passes uh, but i say this is stupid uh, because from my point of view dribbling is a very important point part of our game uh, uh, it is written in the rules uh, how you can do it how it is limited uh, so why not use it and the rules give the players the permission and the possibility to use the dribbling then it, it is stupid from my point of view not to use it uh, with the dribbling first of all the players can be or can win space and time because without dribbling uh, they are limited in space three steps and in time three seconds with the ball but with the dribbling they can extend space and time and the most important aspect especially against an open defense they can be the most dangerous player in the court who is moving with high speed to opponent's goal so that's why i think that dribbling is something very very important that's why all the players should be able to use the dribbling, especially in the one-on-one -on -one situation to the second side, the weak side. Uh, the players should be able to use the left hand for one bounce at least. Uh, then they have more than three. They have altogether six steps. Uh, and then it's easier for them to make the move to the left hand side. Uh, if they're a right-handed player uh, and this is something which helps the players really a lot even against a defensive defense uh, but if the players never use the dribbling in training uh, they will fail when they or make mistakes when they use the dribbling in some game situations uh, i don't want to avoid passing in our game a good player can do both he can use the dribbling and he can use the passing uh? and in a game situation he must decide which option is better uh? but if you always allow and enforce only one option pass 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 uh? and then according to the situation the player must use the dribbling uh? Uh? the probability of a mistake is very high okay let's see a small video from a girls game here and you see how this is worked out when the players try to be the most dangerous player on the court so you see this girl receiving the ball at the own nine meter line winning the one-on-one -on -one situation and now observe the defender at the left side of the picture uh, so this is the one who should be able to help and she has very long time to observe and make a decision to help but she doesn't do she's going away so the correct decision for the player in attack is breakthrough huh? and now you will see in the other elements of that video that all players are doing it in that way 
that all of them try to be the most dangerous player on the court. So fainting, moving, and finally passing. Huh? And this is something very important now here. If you see this player breaking through and then not finalizing, but passing, huh? this is only possible if she bounces the ball without constant observation of the ball. Then she can see the player who is free and give the pass. Next one we see here, very fast. See the free space and accelerate and try to score. Another one from that player. And then after repetition, you will see the very important thing compared to the first one, same player. Now, different decision. So you see her receiving the ball here, using the left hand to go around, then the right hand. Now, second defender, oh, I'm sorry, second defender was coming and then the pass is played. Okay. Now, let's come to instruction number nine. And this is about the decision-making in the game. As I said at the beginning, handball is a complex game of constantly making decisions. And then it's quite normal that the most mistakes in game are decision-making mistakes. Uh, this is something which is really normal. Uh, even there are other types of mistakes. Uh, so sometimes the players have some problems in the, the motor skills, uh, like making side steps not fast enough or something like this. But with some training, you can reduce the number of that mistakes. Uh, very many coaches think that very often technical mistakes are the the biggest number of mistakes in our game. Uh, so last weekend we played against a uh, team, la 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 la, and 20 passes uh, were given to the opponents, they catched it, uh, and uh, 20 technical mistakes. Uh, in my way of thinking, this is not a technical mistake, uh, because in passing, uh, you need to fulfill two criteria. First criteria is correct direction. Second is correct power. And if a pass is in the right direction with the right power, then it's a technically good pass. But if a player in defense steals the ball, catches the ball, uh, then it might be the right direction and the right power, but it's still missing the player who should receive it uh, because the defense has intercepted it. As the player with the ball, uh, I have to give the right direction and the right power to the ball, but I have to observe. First of all, is my opponent, uh, my uh, teammate ready to catch? And second, is around him, my teammate, someone who might jump into that ball and intercept it. And if I feel that someone is there, then I cannot pass. If I pass and the ball will be intercepted, I have made a wrong decision. Huh? And this is why I call this a decision mistake. For throwing, it's the same. Uh, some players, they take shots from situations or positions. They will never be successful. Uh, it's not a technical mistake. It's a mistake to take this shot in that moment. Uh, so that's why decision mistakes are so important in our game. Even in defense, it's the same. In, uh, for instance, in a situation where a defender has to help. Sometimes we see that players don't go for help uh, and the attacker is breaking through. Sometimes even the defender against the ball possessor is controlling the situation. Uh, the player in the neighboring position is going for help. Sorry, wrong decision. Uh, because for my decision to help, it's very important whether attacker in the neighboring position is breaking through or not. If he's under control, I don't go for help. Huh? So you can see from these examples that very, very many 
mistakes in game are decision making mistakes and that's why we must try to make our players better in the decision making and this is why we need to guide the eyes of the players. Eh? See the defender, see the attacker breaking through or not breaking through. And then they can make a proper decision whether to help, whether to pass and so on and so on. Eh? So this is the thing, uh, if the coaches tell the players not what to do, but what to observe, the decision making of the players can be better uh, and this is what we have to try to find uh, in our educational process uh, that the players are making better decisions uh. but this depends on one side on a good structure of training with a lot of decision situations and on the other side of the guidance of the eyes of the players what to observe and then what is the correct reaction or the correct decision in that moment. This is what the players need to learn. Uh, okay, instruction number 10 is the way how competition and training depend on each other. On one side, uh, the competition is responsible for the training uh, because all the things the players need in the competition uh, they have to be worked out in training uh, so as a coach you should make a good game observation uh, and see what are the good moves and the good elements in competition and these are the elements you should try to work out in your training and on the other side to see what is not working in competition and these elements you should avoid uh, and don't work on them in training. Uh, so especially sometimes when you do some uh, tactical elements in attack, you will find out uh, that maybe one or two of your, of your tactical elements, they are completely useless uh, because there is almost no efficiency in those elements. But the team is playing this since 15 years uh, and everybody loves this element because everybody thinks it is successful but from statistics maybe you can find out sorry uh, the quality of or the, the, the efficiency of that move is not very good please avoid it don't do it in training anymore see what are the effective elements and this is, these are the ones uh, from the competition observation you take to your training on the other way round, uh, training is something important for your competition because if we want to have a strong team you have to do hard work in training uh. you cannot always train 80 percent and hope for 100 percent in competition uh. it must be just the other way around you must train at least 120 percent uh, so that in the competition maybe your team reaches 90 or 95 percent sometimes maybe 100 uh, and this is something very important uh, so uh, i saw now very many trainings from coaches in germany uh, with not so many movements in training with too much slow actions not fast playing and so on uh, how can you expect that your players are do that are doing that in a in a successful way when they don't do it even in the training uh, so that's why from my point of view uh, it's very important that your training level is very much high very high even higher as the competition level this should be the best uh, then they can take a little bit rest in competition. Okay, this was the last of these 10 instructions. I hope you could enjoy the session. And now I will go back and stop the screen sharing from my side. It's a pleasure, Klaus. I hope that there is a people with questions. 
or everything was exactly and clear. There is a question from uh, India, as I can see. Uh, Akim, can you call our friend from India to make a question or I will read it? Do you hear me, Akim? Okay. Uh, maybe I can take over because uh, I have this question as a private one. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but because only I can read it, uh, I, I will um, uh, give it to everyone. So it's about uh, the instruction number six. What are the different exercises and practices that the coach can give to his players to improve skills, to use the open defense more during training sessions? Yeah? So if you are playing with young players, yeah, you can play with open defense. This is no problem. It will always have a positive effect on their development. If you're playing with more adult players on higher level, uh, you can introduce this open space game with uh, especially um, drills for fast break. Not only first wave or second wave, but even third wave. Uh, so that five, four or six players are involved in that moment. And then automatically they play in open space and on the other side, the, the uh, defense against them can be uh, using the man-to-man -man defense. Huh? So that's a quite good uh, way. Second part of the questions, what are the different ways to implement during matches when man-to-man -man is applied by the opponent? Um, okay, uh, I think there is a very simple tactic uh, element uh, that you can use for the one-on-one -on -one, uh, or man-to-man -man defense. First is wings to the corner, left and right back court to the sideline, and two players in the center, one move with ball, second coming behind. Uh, space is opened, first way for the ball possessor, one safety, and try to make an, an isolated situation in the center two-on-two, two. it's very easy. So, Another question. We have uh, all questions from India only. Yeah. But what are the ways to, a coach can adopt to make a player to improve his decision making skills? Uh, so, uh, decision making, especially in uh, attack, depends always on defense. Without defense, no decision is needed from attackers. So, the more active the defense is, the more uh, the, the player in attack is enforced uh, to make different decisions. And then variability in defense, open defense, close defense, <coughs> defense in a central position or more to the left <coughs> or more to the right. This is creating some different situations. <coughs> Take over. I hope that you're okay. Uh, too much. Okay. Um, Klaus, on the beginning, you <coughs> called our handball game like head legs game. And that was interesting definition. And when we speak about that in our days in 2019, we have much slower game than in 2011. What do you think that is slower? more slower head or legs um <clears throat> uh, i think uh, i'm sorry for the problems with the with the voice um i think the problem is that the players they need to take a rest uh, if you see for instance the german bundesliga they have too many matches 
and then the players they they are taking rest uh, so um, if they are not enforced from the coaches or from the referee's side by forewarning signal uh, they will try to slow down the game just to give themselves a rest and from the players point of view i can understand this yeah i really can understand this the problem from my point of view are the coaches uh, because the coaches they are the ones they have a full bench with 16 players but they don't use these players all uh, so if they would change the players more then for a shorter time each player could play on a higher level and the speed in the game would be perfect uh, but they don't do this and in the Bundesliga, this is one situation, but in World Championship, it's the same because they have game after game, one uh, day to rest only, next again uh, they have to play, uh, and the load for the players is too high. And if you see the actual development, uh, that now European Handball Federation, International Handball Federation, the national federations too, uh, nobody wants to step back from his big schedule uh, and the problem is that maybe in end of september beginning of october we will start the, the regular matches uh, so it's completely compressed for the next season uh, so they have now a longer time for preparation okay but then uh, the level of competition is so high in german bundesliga they have two teams more because they had no one going down but two going up uh, which means four games more for each team uh, then they have this olympic qualification tournament they have the world championship they have the uh, european uh, final four and so on uh, so the players must take a rest uh, and if the coaches don't give them they take it on the court Thank you, Klaus. I have to say thank you in the name of all of us and thank you for sharing these 10 instructions uh, for the future of handball. Actually, everyone can find something inside and think about after this presentation. I wish you a nice continuation of your journey. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And thank you. For for the rest of you, for everyone, let's see us tomorrow with SNC things with Sasha. Thank you so much, Klaus. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye until tomorrow to everyone.